Coming up, author Mark Griffin joins Ileana in just a minute. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. And now, it's the I Blame Dennis Hopper podcast, starring Ileana Douglas. Eavesdrop with Ileana as she interviews Hollywood's most prominent players about filmmaking, acting, and what really happens on the set of your favorite flicks and TV shows. Hi, it's Ileana Douglas. <laughs> For the I Blame Dennis Hopper podcast. Excuse me, my dentist is calling. <laughs> Sorry, Mary Jo. Um, and I'm here with my lovely co-host, Tamara Bird. Hi, everybody. It's a very loose Thursday. We haven't done a podcast in a little while. I know. Uh, that's, it's just, yeah, I, it's who like, knows what's going to happen. It's come to this. I'm actually working. You're working <laughs> so much that we can barely fit one in. I love it. <laughs> Are you having a good time? Over I'm having there? an amazing time on uh, the show. Uh, I can just say that I'm working on Goliath and I'm having yeah. an amazing time. And it's, uh, but that's all I can say. How's the craft services over there? That's that's really a very important question. Everything is great. I mean, it's uh, you know, I usually stay in my trailer. I'm I'm work. I'm doing some writing in my trailer yeah, too. Yeah. So I uh, I I do bring my own snacks. Of course you do. I am officially like my mother. Oh, my gosh. The other day I was in the uh, grocery store. Yes. And uh, I started joking around with the cashier, and I had that horrifying moment. I was like, oh, no, I am officially like my mother. Uh, because, you know, your whole life you're horrified yes. when your parents are joking around with the cashier. Yes. Like, there's just nothing more embarrassing yes. than that. And uh, I was doing it. I, I, and and it, I didn't stop at one corny joke. No, I think you I, didn't. Oh, look at you. I think I went for two or three. All right. We have Good a lot job. to talk about. It's National Book uh, Day, Day today. Yes. And ironically, what we're going to talk about is the closing. Oh. I can't believe I'm saying this of the Samuel French on Sunset Boulevard. It, uh, is, a, it is absolutely an institution. Yeah, and what's even worse is it it's not even getting a great send off because a couple days ago, I don't even know this, it was somebody robbed it, somebody No. Va- yes. Somebody They v- got to get the good stuff before they close or something? I, I have no idea, That's but ridiculous. somebody vandalized the place and now it's boarded up. <gasps> So this when are they scheduled to close? Because the I'm other thing is, sure. is that I heard, I heard there were people rallying around trying yes, to maybe I'm, save it. I'm going to be there to Saturday at two. Oh, nice! I'll be running from my dance class awesome. to, to there. Hair in a ponytail, and yes, and a leotard. Mm-hmm. And uh, Francis Fisher is going to be there. Note, people, you're going to get to see Ileana live and in person in a leotard if you that's, go to Samuel French on Saturday right. afternoon on Sunset Boulevard on Sunset. And uh, sadly, of course, the backdrop is that it's all plywood. I was thinking, what can we do? Maybe I'll bring my book, read from my book, or yeah. read from any book. Um, I was saying to Mark Griffin outside that his book is the type of book that would flown off the shelves at Samuel French because not only was it, you know, a great place to get plays, but it was an incredible movie bookstore in which everything was lovingly kind of you know edited. curated yeah curated mm-hmm. you'd walk in uh, there was they had beautiful cards and all sorts of really nice christmas things mm. the aesthetic of the store was wonderful yeah the way they had everything arranged but when you walked in there was like this beautiful wall of Things that books that were topical, obviously biographies. You know, if Robert Wagner had just written his book, it was there. Mm. Alec Baldwin written it was there. You know, and it was it just is beautiful. And I'm I'm beyond. I'm more sad about this. I was very sad when the sheet music store oh, also closed. I loved that store, Hollywood Sheet Music, which is now a uh, manicure pedicure place. And oh, I, I just that. don't understand yeah. it, you know. It's 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 just really sad. These things seem to happen in a blink of an eye, and you don't have any warning, and then they're gone, and then it's a Chipotle or it's a mm-hmm. Starbucks mm-hmm. or something like that. But um, well, you know, uh, I come sad. from the Bay Area, and City Lights Books in San Francisco, mm-hmm. in, incredible institution in the, in a similar way. Uh, that Samuel French was, and I believe they've saved that store from closing. So maybe, maybe have a little bit of hope. I know you're a reckless cynic, but uh, yeah. 
Well, because again, this seems to be so typical of, of Los Angeles that has lost the hotel ambassador. Yes. Which was where Kennedy was killed. Robert I mean, Kennedy the place was, should have was, been a museum. Yes. And where countless films, I've shot countless films at the ambassador. Oh, my it was gosh. In, I mean, it was an incredible place. And yes. boom, it's knocked down. The yes. Garden of Allah, which of course I never saw, that was torn yes. down. Chasen's uh, became Bristol Farms. Yes. Oh, the that Brown was, that Derby. That was a really sad one. The Hamburger Chasen's. Hamlet, you know. Yeah. And I don't know. It just, it, it makes me particularly sad because Los Angeles is the movie capital of the world. And they seem to be the most guilty of just destroying uh, the culture of artists. And, and the history of, of film. Yeah, and you get to the point where you believe that, you know, that, are they doing it on purpose? I mean, do we really need another... Chipotle? I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, we, I, that's what it's going to be. I mean, the blockbuster down the street, I mean, I understand nobody makes movies anymore, but every time I go by what used to be the blockbuster, and it's now a bank, and there's a bank across the street, you know, it's, you know, these banks go up and these... Starbucks go up and these, you know, fast food places go up. And uh, I mean, again, I don't know. I mean, if you want to run a manicure pedicure shop, you, you get a. It's like there's one on every corner. But to but to just to not have a beautiful bookstore like Samuel French that has been in that location, and mark my words, because I live very near this area. This area is desolate. It, mm. it is not, it's really sad. Meltdown, which was across the street. I mean, that's why I'm spending a lot of time with this. It's, it, they took away Meltdown. What was, what was Meltdown? Meltdown was an incredible, um, it was like a comic book store. They sold oh. graphic novels right. in the back. The people did, the Nerdist did the podcast in the back. Oh, no kidding. Uh, again, just an incredible artistic hub where you'd see comedians uh, you could go in there, you could hang out, you could get coffee and see other people and feel that, you know, there was some hope in your life. <laughs> and, t and you know, that I was very sad that that went away. And now Samuel French, I, I, and it's going to hurt the Pikey too, which is the little bar next door. But that is it. We're killing, you know, we're killing artists in our society. And, and that's the way it is. And building walls. Oh, my God. There's Meltdown. Don't get me started. Thank you. Yeah. Meltdown was amazing. And anytime I was lonely, I could walk in and people could recognize me from Ghost World. No. Well, it's always a good <laughs> thing. I'm kidding. Look at how cool that place was. That's what you want on Sunset Boulevard. Yes. That's what tourists come to see. Yes. They don't come to see a Chipotle. I totally agree with you. I'm very, very upset by this. And you and should be. I hope people come out tomorrow. Let's, listen, not Saturday. much is... T sorry, not tomorrow. Uh, Saturday, apologies. I'm old. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and just see us. We'll hang out and we'll cry together. Yeah. But anyway, in let's the meantime... Bring let's bring in Mark, shall we? Let's talk about Mark Griffin. Yeah. This is... Uh, I hosted uh, the other night, along with Larry Edmonds uh, Bookstore... At the uh, TCL Theater, who uh, they're becoming fantastic and doing uh, interviews with Piper Laurie and Mark Griffin. It's the author uh, of the uh, this great book on Rock Hudson. His first book, which I discovered the other night, a is about Vincent Minnelli, which I can't wait to read that. A Hundred or More Hidden Things, Life and Films of Vincent Minnelli. And this one is, of course, All That Heaven Allows, about Rock Hudson. I can't wait to read it. I was already skimming it please welcome mark griffin thank you so much iliana where's your you don't have your sparkly tux from the last time I... swarovski crystals on the lapel oh, yeah. i i left that back in palm springs oh right. wait next to uh, next to liberace's house <laughs> palm springs or is it actually in a garment bag out there uh, <laughs> that that was the plain black shirt oh. in case this didn't read well oh I, okay i try to come prepared you so. you clearly do now i love i'm so excited first of all that you're here on national book day yeah oh i didn't know that yeah. yes That's now exciting. aside from your two books which we're plugging do you have any favorite movie books you know i the other day i i uh i 
put a book up. My very first movie book that was a gift, it was uh, the Arlene Croce book about Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, my grandfather gave me when I was a kid. But did you have favorite movie books that you perused? This may shock you, but all of my favorite books when I was a youngster were about Judy Garland. So oh. <laughs> I had a collection of about 20 Judy bios and yeah. would read them incessantly. Yeah. This is completely <laughs> off topic, but if you were I, if I were on a desert island, I always say like for music, I would do I I'd go with Judy live at Carnegie Hall. You can't get any better than that. It and really can't. It's it, still in print. It's never been out of print since 1961. Really? Think about that. Yeah. I am. I, I mean, every time when you, a few months go by and then you you hear Judy Garland, you just go, yeah, she was phenomenal. It's just an amazing, um, an amazing talent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to get your books, but uh, our fun game on the show is we always ask people, do you remember the first movie that you saw and who took you to see it? I do. It was Napoleon and Samantha, 1972. And my older sister, Joanne, and one of her high school friends took me. They were very well-meaning. Uh -huh. And it was a Disney <laughs> film with little Jodie Foster, little Johnny Whitaker. And they were saving um, a circus lion who was past his prime. Ooh, and they, they, they ran away with the lion. <laughs> and I was completely traumatized, not only by the film and the lion, but also, they took me up into the balcony, thinking that that was going to be a great adventure for a four- or five-year-old boy. Yeah. And it was the opposite. I was left sobbing hysterically. And so it's interesting that, you know, for someone who later became a movie obsessive, yeah, that the first experience was so neurotic and horrible. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's another, that's a good one to, to look at. But we, now, did, your, uh, did you have any aspirations before you started writing movie books? Like, did you do little film reviews in school or were you that kind of a movie kid? I was. I was a very precocious, uh, almost like a mini Noel Coward. I would sit at, my parents got me a baby <laughs> Smith Corona typewriter. Mm -hmm. And I would sit there virtually all day cranking out little novellas and short stories and scripts. And then a couple of years later, they got me a Bell and Howell movie camera. Mm -hmm. And so I would, the poor kids in the neighborhood would be, you know, forced to appear in all of my little home movie productions and... I did do a three-hour version of The Wizard of Oz with all the kids from school. Oh, and wow. Yeah, I always prided myself on my version was more faithful to L. Frank Baum's <laughs> text than the MGM version. Of course, so. it, of course it was. Yeah. <laughs> I, he, I, I was... It. <laughs> what is it? I'm always fascinated, but what is it that drive? What kind of crazy ego drives people? I, I'm, I think when I was in third grade, I, I forced people. Uh, we didn't have a movie camera, but we reenacted the Pearl. And with oh. one of my friends actually was the Pearl. Like she was a pillow. <laughs> I put pillows around her, and there a photograph luckily exists of this. But it's so funny how you're like, no, I, yeah. I and now I must take my film, my film to the masses, which is the school auditorium you right know. and this is in the hinterlands of lewiston maine so yes which i was surprised so you're from maine mm -hmm, if you can believe it southern maine did what kind of um what i mean you know you think of maine as so rural but mm -hmm. there what so were, were you getting first run films there to, to look at I mean, to this day, if you go to the Cineplex, it's like Kung Fu Panda on six screens. <laughs> so we would get a movie probably, if we were lucky, like a year and a half after its yes. original theatrical it's, run. It's like us. Yes. Yeah. But I made the best of it because our local public TV station would air, like, they had a Warner Brothers package from the 40s, so I got to see all of the Betty Davis and Bogey movies and... I would tape record them. This was before the advent of the VCR. Oh my God, we are the same person. Yeah, <laughs> I did the same thing. This is, you, yes, yes. And, and then the next day, you would relive the experience, <laughs> memorize the dialogue, yes. and then force your neighborhood friends to act out Dark Victory. And you know, of course, I get to be Betty with the brain tumor. And you know, <laughs> I like that you did Dark Victory. Well, I would always, I'd always, of course, do movies that my grandfather was in. That, that was my thing. And yeah, I had a GE. Mm -hmm. I had a GE tape recorder, which was to this day my favorite present that I have ever, ever received with a little microphone. And That you know. was a great gift. Oh my yeah. God. I mm -hmm. love that. So did you discover, were you a fan of Rock Hudson's before 
you decided to write about him? I, I would say that I had a healthy respect, and over time that continued to grow. Because mm-hmm. when I was younger, a lot of his films, unless you got lucky, weren't really readily available on TV, even on The Late Show. Some of them were. Mm-hmm. But as I got older, I started to watch a lot of these performances, and particularly as he grew and matured, I said, wow, this is he's really interesting, and there's more mm-hmm. to him than just the beautiful heartthrob. Yes. And I one of the goals, if you will, with All That Heaven Allows was to sort of reclaim him as an American film icon. Mm-hmm. Because when the AFI did that list about a decade ago where they listed the 100 greatest film stars, rock wasn't even on it, which Aww. I found kind of inconceivable. Yeah. So I said, you know, this is somebody that was in films directed by Douglas Sirk and George mm-hmm. Stevens, and he's appearing opposite Doris Day and Elizabeth Taylor, number one film star for nearly a decade yeah. based on exhibitor polls. And I thought, well, what has happened to his legacy? Why are we sort of forgetting about how important Rock Hudson was? And And why are we? Because, again, when we were talking the other night, what I found so fascinating about him is the phases – of his uh, career, the different, you know, um, there's the the Douglas Sirk period, which now seems more important. Like when I was growing up, it was the Doris Day films that were, in, in, you know, imprinted in me. Right. And yeah, what, what I mean, why is it that people just don't think of him when he's so iconic? Right, and he's sort of right in front of our face in a, in a yeah, sense, I guess, right? Yeah. Over sixty feature films, so he's he's very much there. But I think after Rock's death in 1985 from AIDS, I think the public perception was that in a... And and then also that was followed by very high-profile Mark Christian trial. Mm -hmm. There were some tell-all books that came out in the mid-'80s. And I think all of these things combined sort of tarnished his reputation, if you will. And he was no longer here to defend himself. Yeah. And... You know, th- more than 30 years have now passed since he died. And I said, this is a good time to reevaluate and reassess and mm-hmm. take a really comprehensive and careful look at not only the life, but the films and the whole show business career and really give this man his due. Mm-hmm. You know? One of the things uh, we, ta- we talked about, too, that was very surprising to learn was he the, had a, kind of a terrible childhood. It's almost something out of Charles Dickens, isn't it? It's yeah. really kind of sad and bleak. He grew up in Winnetka, Illinois, which is about 20 minutes outside of Chicago. And during the height of the Depression, 1931, Rock's biological father sadly abandoned the family, both Rock and his mother. This was when Hudson was about five years old. And, you know, the mother had to sort of really scrounge to find work and support herself and her young son. And then a few years later, she had the misfortune of marrying this very ill-tempered, volatile, alcoholic former Marine who did adopt Rock, but also would abuse him and the mother, physically Mm -hmm. abuse him and the mother as well. So very sad. And it's interesting that throughout the whole life, when you really map it out, this is someone who's beleaguered. They're facing dramatic circumstances at virtually every turn. Mm -hmm. You know, closeted sexuality, um, blackmail attempts, extortion attempts, um, maybe a marriage that seems by our contemporary perspective. (laughs) we We have to get to the crazy marriage, yeah. Right. But what's interesting to me is that Rock never lost sight of his goal, which was to become a screen actor. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, you know, he always maintained this um, sense of goodwill. And that's what I saw, too. In every interview, he seemed sort of unflappable. And even when they were talking about his dire childhood, Mm -hmm. he just everybody describes him. You know, Piper Laurie was saying, oh, he's such a joker and so sweet. And that that sweetness really you know, shines through. Yeah, I think some of these unfortunate circumstances would have really derailed, uh, you know, a person who was not as strong as Rock. Mm -hmm. But it's astounding to me that he sailed through all of this and with sense of humor intact, as you say, and also just maintained this sort of dignity about him. Yeah. The other thing, of course, that uh, is always shocking, you know, when you're thinking about it in the present day, is that his, um, and we're talking about casting couch things, but his agent manager, Henry Wilson, who discovered him, was he literally a truck, was that true, or was he trying to get into show business? 
Or was uh, he just a truck driver? And Henry Wilson said, you're so good looking, right. you need to be an actor. When he first relocated <laughs> to the West Coast, this was in the late 1940s, he was a truck driver. He was driving around like frozen apricots and distributing <laughs> things like that to supermarkets. Forget of a movie. Yeah. <laughs> and he had never sort of communicated this secret goal or ambition to become an actor. Mm -hmm. And so many people, you know, he was obviously turning heads constantly, not only because of, you know, how stunningly handsome he was, but also his height, six foot four. Mm -hmm. So he's sort of an Adonis who's a truck driver. And yes, so eventually he does meet Henry Wilson, who becomes this very much like a cross between Harvey Weinstein and Henry Higgins. So on the one hand, you have this very uh, manipulative yeah. and predatory, um, you know, uh, manager of one of the busiest all-male casting coaches in Hollywood. It's unbelievable. Yes. And, and spoiler alert, we're going to get to this. Your book has been optioned, and they're going to make a movie. I hope they're going to... Oh, my God, who gets to play Henry, Henry Wilson? What a great part. I the mean... Virtually guaranteed a Best Supporting Actor Oscar nomination, right? Be because it's fascinating. Because yeah. what's fascinating about it is the acceptance of Rock Hudson and Tab Hunter and Rory Calhoun and all these people that just, they just accepted it. Mm -hmm. That if you were going to be in show business... Now, is that because... It would have been harder to have a straight manager to deal with, do you think? I'm not sure. I about wonder if Henry, you know, positions it in a way like, listen, I understand you and I understand your needs and I understand what we're going to need to do PR wise to right. cover things up. Exactly. I and, I, and on the other hand, if you take a look at how vulnerable some of these young men were, like, yeah. Rock, you know, very handsome, but had no formal acting training whatsoever and was mm -hmm. sort of fresh off the bus from Winnetka, if you will. Guy Madison had been a sailor. Rory Calhoun had been an ex-con. <laughs> so he, he's got the raw material to work with. But if you positioned it in, I can only imagine that Henry Wilson may have said to them, I am your ticket to the big time. Yeah. And they may have, you know, that may have been true in a sense. Would, it, would anyone else have looked at these guys or made a serious legitimate yeah. attempt to get them into films? Yes. Yeah, so it is. It, it's kind of a Jekyll and Hyde thing. That's why it's so fascinating because obviously Rock Hudson flourished. And again, I don't know if this is true or not, but it, it, it's at some point it's intimated that Tab Hunter's career and Rory Calhoun's career suffered when Confidential Magazine was going to, you know, published something. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. Sure. So as legend has it, Confidential Magazine, which was sort of the big scandal sheet of the 50s, which no one would admit to reading, but everyone did because the circulation yeah. numbers were in the millions in the 50s. They were threatening to uh, expose rock as they had done with some other stars like Van Johnson. Um, and Henry Wilson reportedly got wind of this and negotiated some sort of a deal. And depending on who you listen to, uh, the, the story that I tend to believe is that Rory Calhoun and Tab Hunter were the two that were thrown under the bus to save Rock's career. Mm -hmm. As In the late 50s, he was the number one star in the world. So Henry Wilson didn't want to lose that golden goose, obviously. Yeah. So uh, suddenly you see these two expose stories, you know, Rory Calhoun, for the grace of God, still a convict. <sighs> And then Tab Hunter was exposed for having attended an all-male pajama party, I think is how it was expressed. Yeah. And the reason I tend to believe that version of the story is Hunter had dismissed Wilson as his agent about six months prior to the article. Mm -hmm. So if you put a piece all of that together, it, it seems the most logical version of that. Okay, let's get into the Douglas Sirk. Well, actually, before that, what the, the movie that he did with Raoul Walsh, I'm sort of curious about. Mm -hmm. I mean, was he, re, you know, his early, I, that's the other thing that I think is surprising about him. For me growing up, you know, I discovered him through the Doris Day movies and then the Douglas Sirk movies. But then you go, oh, he was, he was in all these little bit parts at Universal. They, they were putting him in you know, these little, so I want to talk about like how, how he, how did he find his footing mm -hmm. in those early films? So I think at Universal, sort of one of the smart things that they did at that studio was really try you out in a succession of bit parts, one-liners, walk-ons mm -hmm. to see, to get a sense of where you might fit best. And I think in Rock's case, they 
went purely based on his physicality. They put uh-huh. him in a series of cheap adventure movies. So he's playing Arabs, he's playing prize fighters, he's yeah. playing thugs. And I don't think that they got a sense early on, well, here's, you know, this guy looks like Prince Charming. He's probably best served in romantic melodramas. Right. And instead they put him um, in these movies like The Golden Blade with Piper Laurie, which is wonderful. They're very entertaining. Yeah. But they're, in a sense, very one-dimensional. So you don't get a sense that there is um, a deeper talent waiting in the wings. Mm Mm-hmm. And But the one with Raoul Walsh, his film debut was actually with Warner Brothers, interestingly. And Henry Wilson sold Rock's contract to Raoul Walsh. And there were high hopes that Fighter Squadron was going to be Rock's first showcase. Yeah. And he was so tongue-tied and so nervous and so uncomfortable before the cameras that... I think they ultimately scrapped the one big scene that he was supposed to be in. Mm -hmm. And so now he's just reduced to a few little bits of dialogue. You do see him in the film. Yeah. But it's certainly not the breakthrough that they were. Yeah, because that's what I, when I saw the role of Walsh, you would have thought that that would have been a a good fit in a Mm -hmm. way. Um, So then he gets in. So then now let's go to the Douglas Sirk movie. So he really gets his kind of his big break is to be in the Magnificent Obsession mm. with that lush Technicolor. <laughs> and this was something, again, that pardon me for repeating myself, but, you know, Orson Welles always says oh, that, you know, p- movie stars look better in black and white. However, in my opinion, Rock mm. Hudson actually looks better in color. Right. He That film, I mean, all those films, but the color is just captivating. You know, he's almost like a cartoon. It's like the colors are so, and his voice is so yeah. nice. But how does he get the part in Magnificent Obsession? I think they finally figured out, he was sort of groomed for a couple of years. They knew that that property was waiting in the wings. It was a remake from an earlier version from the 1930s that had made Robert Taylor a great star. Oh. So Universal was banking that lightning would strike twice, mm-hmm. and they put uh, Rock together with Douglas Sirk on Taza, son of Cochise, yes. which is kind of a cheap, a little bit of a low and budget. And then the other, the, for me and my gal. Which we just, yeah, which honored we the, the other, other night. night. Yes. That's a very entertaining little film. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of fun with Piper Laurie. Right. And Magnificent Obsession works so well because finally they hit upon the winning formula that, mm-hmm. you know, here is the heartthrob, the matinee idol for a new generation. We're going to pair him romantically with the Oscar winning Jane Wyman. And, you know, hearts will be a flutter because, you know, he's finally found the right vehicle to the breakthrough vehicle to present him correctly. Mm -hmm. And then it was such an enormous success that they reteamed Rock and Jane Wyman in All That Heaven Allows. The studio was inundated with fan mail. Like, you have to put them together in another movie because, yeah, everyone was so um, taken with Magnificent Obsession. Well, it's just wonderful to see, even though some of the plot is just completely... Totally implausible. <laughs> completely. <laughs> it's like, I con- think Cirque himself said it's gloriously insane, you know. Yeah, but it's... Uh, my favorite thing, of course, is when he hits her in the car. Sorry, spoiler alert, but I mean, I don't, she's incredible in it. And you could, I love that you could hi, you could simply recover your eyesight by going to Switzerland or where where, where does she get her operation? I it's can't. Shadow Mountain. Mountain is the name of the facility that Jane ends God, up in. Yes. I love this. And, and Rock is the one who performs of the course, operation. Of course, of course, <laughs> he must. Um, and so then, uh, all that heaven allows, and just another beautiful lush. And the, and I think this one is almost the one that everybody thinks of because he's appearing in that beautiful plaid shirt. And, mm-hmm. Looks like he's just stepped out of the pages of a vintage LL Bean catalog. Yes. Right? And the deer are eating out of his hand, and yeah, it's unbelievable. And he's um, <laughs> he probably like never even saw he never saw a wood shop in his life. Um, but and he's technically he's supposed to be the younger man in that, mm-hmm. although it's not obvious, right? But he is the younger man. It's a little bit naughty. It's yeah. the May December sort of romance, and also. There's a class um, scenario because Jane right. Wyman is this recently widowed woman who's well-to-do and Rock is her gardener, which back then was 
sort of taboo, I guess, that you could not date your maintenance man. Or your <laughs> 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 and the entire town turns against her. She's practically lynched for... I know. Yeah. I know they won't. They will not accept. But it's very daring again because you you know it's you don't normally see that. It's another thing that he's able to pull off is that for a submissive character, he really pulls it off, and you're really kind of rooting for him. You know, whereas I would think that sometimes maybe certain lead actors wouldn't want to take that, wouldn't want to take a part like that. Right, because it does seem sort of secondary to her character in a sense, yeah. but. So much pivots around him in the story that, and he got wonderful reviews for it. Yeah, you know. it's being so sensitive. Do you think that he ever? So now that he's in his stride, is 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 there at all any concern for now that he would be outed, or how does this double life dynamic fit in with him now being a major movie star? He's going out with Vera Ellen or fake dates or what's right. happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is where the pressure is really on him because yeah. even Life magazine did a cover story on Rock in 1955 and the editors threw down the gauntlet in the first sentence of the paragraph. They said something, and I'm paraphrasing here, but Rock Hudson is 29 years old, he's not married, and he needs to explain why not. Oh. So this is not even Confidential Magazine. He's being baited in the mainstream press. Right. And they had, at this time, his publicist, the studio, Henry Wilson, had sort of exhausted all of their efforts to, you know, portray Rock as the ultimate Hollywood bachelor. <laughs> you know, he was nearing 30, and, right. you know, if this is the great matinee idol, why isn't he partnered with one of these women that he's uh, constantly shown um, escorting to premieres? Right. You know? So I think um, this is when I imagine Henry Wilson sat down with Rock and said, you know, we really need to do something because they're breathing down your neck. Mm -hmm. And, you know, depending on who you talk to, some people felt that Rock was part of that discussion and other right. people wondered if he wasn't. And he was, because he was such a non-confrontational and passive individual, mm -hmm. did he just take orders from Henry Wilson? Did he just do whatever his agent decreed? It sort of seems like it. I mean, again, one of the most upsetting little things about him is this that she secretly the uh, uh, tape recorded him. Right. And he sounds just sort of pitiful. Um, it's very sad, very revealing. Yeah. This We're talking about Phyllis Gates, the woman he was married to for three years. And towards the end of the marriage, she surreptitiously, as you said, tape yeah. recorded him through a private detective. And then we should point out, would have had access to those recordings. So one can only imagine if you have that kind of ammunition at your disposal right. in an era when gay equaled death in terms right. of a career, what one could have done with that material. You know, he see, what is shocking to me is, and you mentioned to Ken, that how many times he was blackmailed and how this never... To the public, he didn't become an alcoholic. He didn't crash his cars. You know, he always just seemed like this, you know, formidable movie star. Right. I mean, I can't tell you how many of the co-stars or the screenwriters or directors just said he was the consummate professional, always a gentleman, you yeah. know, impeccably well-mannered. Mm -hmm. And it's rewarding to hear that, you know, for someone that was having to grapple with, you know, so many different personal challenges. Yeah. I really admire the fact that he was able to behave, you know, in such a dignified way. Yeah. yeah. And so what what will be great, I guess, about your book is just, again, imagining him, seeing him in the movies and then think, oh, my God, to be like, secretly record it you know it's just terrible like some of the the things that he had to um you know that he had to go through all right now let's talk about giant another mm -hmm. film i mm -hmm. love giant um and just how magnificent he was and did he have uh any competition with james dean at all did they there were some that was the new kid. I mean, they were the polar opposites of movie star and then actor studio right, type right. of acting. By all accounts, they did have a rivalry, and I think it was based on a number of things. They, mm -hmm. We should mention they had both appeared in Has Anybody Seen My Gal? <gasps> that's right. Jimmy yes. Dean has that he's brief got, little cameo. That's, he's got the little cameo. Thank you. Yes. And some people told me their history, their kind of tumultuous history might date back to that film. Did Rock make an overture to the younger player that was then rebuffed? We don't exactly know if that happened. Oh, I love that it's idea. conceivable. That's... 
And then when they do get on location in Marfa, Texas for Giant, this great sprawling epic, you know, as you say, Jimmy Dean was kind of the La Fon Terrible of yeah. the actor's studio. And he was coming in. He had already shot East of Eden, but it hadn't been released. Mm -hmm. But already there was this great buzz that this is the next big thing. You know, he's right. really going to set the screen on fire. And Rock, you know, had just finally found himself in a big prestige film directed by George Stevens. Mm -hmm. So, and he's in the lead. And I'm sure, you know, an actor being an actor, he doesn't want to relinquish um, that sort of power to a, uh, a supporting player. Right. And I think another part of the rivalry may have been based around Elizabeth Taylor because mm -hmm. Hudson and Taylor really hit it off when they first met and bonded almost immediately. Yeah. And that friendship would endure, as we know, to the end of his life. Mm -hmm. And I think when Jimmy Dean arrived a little bit later, he kind of squired Elizabeth away and would kind of pull her away from Hudson. And one wonders now, I thought about this, could that have been sort of an actor's studio trick because he's sort of mirroring the relationship that's going on in the yeah. film? Well, one of the great scenes in the movie is when they have the fist fight after, uh, oh my God, that scene's incredible after Dean is discovered oil and they have this terrible fist fight and he's slathered in molasses you know which is <laughs> filling in just to, you know substituting for the oil yeah but i wonder if they're and it's a little unnerving because again it does feel like they're really you know they couldn't wait to take a swing at each other and and ron Hudson's a big guy big you know? strapping hunk yeah yeah and it's interesting in later interviews rock whenever he was constantly yeah. asked about james dean and he mm -hmm. would always say well you know he was a remarkable talent but as a professional he did not have any respect for jimmy because he i guess dean would constantly keep them waiting in the sweltering heat on mm -hmm. location with no apologies there would be and you know rock tended to be very consummately professional mm -hmm. so I think he may have viewed that as, you know, not acceptable behavior. Now, and then Giant, he was nominated for, th this was his only nomination, right? Was Sadly and astoundingly, the sole Oscar nomination in that whole career. And did they do a campaign? You know, because again, you forget that he, you always think about James Dean and Giant, mm -hmm. but he, he was nominated you know, also, and did they do a campaign for him? Because you don't really think of him in that way. Well, by the time Giant was released, Dean was deceased. Right. And they were, if I'm remembering this correctly, I think they were nominated against each other. Oh. So they would have canceled each other out. And then yeah. the winner proved to be Yule Brenner in The King and I. Right. Which but did it lead? So, I mean, so here's this big, like, his whole career is leading up to Giant. And why didn't it leapfrog? To him doing better parts because the next time he sort of emerges is pillow talk and doris day movies and was that his choice or what what happened there well he had to beg universal to be loaned out for giant and wow. they made that very difficult for him he had to renew his contract and there was yeah. a whole negotiation process around that but it's true as you say once giant was over you would think that this would be followed up by other big a-list prestige films right but universal sort of quickly returned him to the melodrama formula That's too bad yeah because you'd see him like just as we're talking i'm thinking you know like he he should have been in the young lions or something mm -hmm. i mean they should have put him in films like right. that right he does make an effort. He signed on to do A Farewell to Arms, the mm -hmm. remake with Jennifer right. Jones, and it's a big David O. Selznick production. Yeah. Originally, it's going to be directed by John Huston, so Rock had very high hopes for that. And then, unfortunately, Huston left the project, change of director. It was a very troubled production. Yeah. And he had turned down several projects. I think Sayonara, possibly, was one oh. that he passed on. So I think that he made efforts to yeah. diversify and to do things outside of the universal comfort zone. Mm -hmm. But I think the studio fought him in in a lot of respects. Now, is he still working with Henry Wilson at this point? Yes, they are. They stay together until 1966. So it's pretty late yeah that's a long that's and, a long time mm -hmm. and so then his next incarnation is the the doris day movies and had he ever met 
Doris Day before that, I wonder? I, I, I think he was aware of her. There's this wonderful story that when he was in the service, when they first shipped out, I think it was, to Samar, he served in the Philippines, mm -hmm. that over the ship's loudspeaker, it was the new hit was playing Sentimental Journey by the young Doris Day, mm -hmm. and all the sailors were crying. I, I hope that's a true story, because yeah. it just would Aww. be great to know that it, it actually played out that way. Yeah. But I don't think they knew each other that well, and Rock was initially resistant to Pillow Talk, because he just, felt it was so risque. I know, and, it's just so funny. Yeah. And he was neurotic about the fact that apart from Has Anybody Seen My Gal, he hadn't had the opportunity to play comedy on film. And I think he was really nervous about that. And, and he's so well suited for comedy. I mean, and then again, you think, why didn't he just do, he was so good in this. Why didn't he do, not that you would know this, but the... What is the one with uh, James Garner that you always think Rock Hudson should be in? Is it The Thrill of It All? Yes. I think that's the title. Yeah. yeah. Why yeah. didn't he, like, how did he get that? He, they were on this great run of doing all these. Right. To, they did Pillow Talk. What did they do after Pillow Talk? Lover Come Back, which yeah. a lot of diehard rock fans think is actually even superior to Pillow Talk. That uh -huh. would be my opinion. I think it's just wittier and the, their rhythms are they they're perfect they're sublime in pillow talk but i yeah. think they've sort of nailed it once they get to the second one yes and then send me no flowers is the third and all of these films were blockbusters but the third one doesn't have that sort of cat and mouse chase that we've come to love yeah. about them and they're already married in that one, and he's a hypochondriac. And it is funny, yeah. but it, it doesn't have the energy that the other Pillow two. Pillow Talk is a blast. Just the production design alone is hysterical. Doris in Jean-Louis gowns, you know. <laughs> every Yeah, every outfit. And yeah. uh, and and he just plays it straight, and he's, super, he's just so funny. I love the scene where he's carrying her right. you know, back to this. And one of Rock's boyfriends told me that um, when he first got to know Rock, his, he said his muscles in his back were aching from having to carry Doris around the lot all day. Uh -huh. So, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but, they, but they did, so again, they did so well. And so then what does he do? Like in between, just take time off, or he doesn't do theater. He doesn't uh, like he does theater much, much later. Mm -hmm. There was a um, a detour into television with Tallulah Bankhead, if you can believe that's it. That's right. He yeah. did that crazy. The big th is it the big show? I think that's the title of it. The big no, the big party by Revlon. That's what it is, and it's meant it's to best. feel the viewer is supposed to be. Go feeling... to YouTube right now and get put it up because it is riveting. It's hysterical. Rock Tallulah, Esther Williams, Sammy Davis. It's almost like a pop culture. Yeah, Sammy Davis, as I recall, is like one of the highlights. Yeah, yeah, he Just does a great job. The door. It's like you know a typical night in Hollywood. The door <laughs> opens and Sammy Davis Jr. comes in and starts singing. But that, needless to say, that did not last long. It didn't work. I think that was a little too... It worked for us. It worked for us, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Yeah, see, the big party. There it is, the Rebel big Island. party. Your team is quick, Ileana. Yay, yeah. I love it. We love Jeff. <laughs> uh, okay, so we gotta, we're got we running out of time, but I want to... Then we have to get to uh, my favorite Rock Hudson movie, which is brilliant, which is Seconds. Mine too. Mm. Um I'm skipping over Written on the Wind. What what year was Written on the Wind, by the way? 57, I want to say. I don't know. Which or... I love Written on the Wind, too, just because mm -hmm. it's lurid and fun and, you know. Gloriously you... over the top. Oh, my know. God. The that... Mambo of Death, which Dorothy Malone does, you know, in her negligee. Which, <laughs> as we were commiserating outside, Dorothy Malone left off of the Oscars. Glaring oversight. In yeah. memoriam, really sad. Anyway, we love her. Um, but so seconds, how does he get cast in seconds? John Frankenheimer's now considered masterpiece, but mm. didn't do so well when it came out. Right. Shockingly. So rock wanted to diversify. He was sort of tiring of trading on the pillow talk formula after yeah. doing a succession of those romantic comedies. And he wanted something really different. That was a legitimate acting challenge. Here comes this property that is based on a brilliant novel by David Eli, dark dystopian thriller, which is about swapping out your authentic identity for a more manufactured one. So bingo, that's sort of semi-autobiographical, if you will. Yeah. And uh, originally the casting was Kirk Douglas, then they veered off into Laurence Olivier until Paramount said, well, we need a bigger uh, bankable star. And mm -hmm. this is where Rock Hudson came into it. 
And initially, this is sort of a before and after characterization where the same actor was going to play the, both the before and the after. Right. Rock is the one who suggested, well, I think it would be more interesting if two different actors played the before and after. Yeah. And I think he had that was oh. a really smart choice. Brilliant. Yeah. And if you haven't seen, of all the Rock Hudson films, if you have not seen Seconds, it's the most surprising, it's the most dramatically compelling and I think it's the rawest and truest performance in a yeah. sense. Yeah. There's one scene that is very disturbing and I he- I think I heard through the whatever maybe some of the voiceover commentary that he ha- in order to do the drunken orgy scene I, he that was the one that he was the most afraid of. Right and I think I think about most leading men in the late 1960s it would in a sense be very very risky to, to do this project at all but yeah. then to say we need you to hop into a vat of grapes naked and stomp <laughs> around I mean and if that doesn't get you to see seconds nothing will but he was really a good sport about that and He did he very quickly you could tell but he was drunk he had to get drunk he had to get really really drunk. Right Frankenheimer employed a lot of directorial tricks like getting him smashed to be in that party sequence where the big revelation comes or strapping him down to a gurney at the end and not letting them release him so yeah yeah rock really suffered for his art in that one i would say and the and the tragedy was that it premiered it can't and you just can't figure it out because it's so brilliant and when it first came out it can people just hated it yeah, the screenwriter John Lewis Carlino told me, he said, we thought we would have something that the French intelligentsia would go crazy yeah. over, that they would eat it up. And he said when it initially premiered, booed, and then when they realized Rock was in the audience, this you know thunderous ovation came forward. But And some of the critics of the time got it, and others yeah. didn't. But now, of course, it's revered as a great cult film, which it should be. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's really a masterpiece, and it really is. God, he's he's just brilliant in it. Um, mm. I can't tell you how much I love it. So, we, again, we don't have t- too much time left, but I, I just want to talk a little bit about, again, some of the, the way this image sort of was tarnished of being... Um, of dying of AIDS in 1985, but again, the significance of that, of the legacy that although it's tragic that it really put AIDS and Elizabeth Taylor, um, you know, helping uh, on the map. And and do you talk about that in the in the book? I do. I mean, Randy Schultz, who wrote that beautiful book and the band played on, said, which is about the AIDS epidemic, Mm -hmm. said there was AIDS before Rock Hudson and there was AIDS after. Mm -hmm. And his celebrity did so much to draw attention to the disease. Mm -hmm. He was really the most high profile celebrity that had been diagnosed or or died of of AIDS at that time, at least. And I think it was this notion that Rock had always been the boy next door and millions of movie goers had seen him grow up in front of their eyes. And Mm -hmm. so this is not, it's not the sort of fuzzy nebulous, oh, you know, maybe intravenous drug users or Haitians who are dying. This is Rock Hudson, major Hollywood icon. Right. And so suddenly everyone all over the world knew someone who had AIDS. And I think that really brought the pandemic home to people. Mm-hmm. It's it's a sad commentary on our culture that it took that, but yeah. I think rock inadvertently, if you will, played a major role in how uh, you know finally administrative funding came through to fight HIV and I know you can't. It's still crazy for me because I remember you know being in school. Remember the big dynasty. With Linda Evans, yeah. That he kissed Linda Evans, and it was like, I mean, that was like the drama. So much hysteria surrounding that. Did you interview uh, Linda Evans? We corresponded, and I was glad mm-hmm. that she took the position that Rock was sort of doing his best to protect her. He was, it was the most chaste kiss you can possibly imagine, Yeah, you know, on the side of her mouth. So he was aware that he had been diagnosed. Yeah. And, you know, people said to her, How, aren't you mad at him? Aren't you angry that he put you at jeopardy like that? And she said, no, he did everything he possibly could to be protective. Yeah. Um, and also, he was. Uh, it's if it's very strange that Ronald Reagan was the president at the time because having worked with Jane Wyman, and again, they weren't weren't doing anything no. uh, to help. No, not at all. And then, as we mentioned, you know, Rock's great friend Elizabeth Taylor was really galvanized after she saw right. not only Rock but the death of two of her assistants who mm-hmm. were gay men. 
And she said something needs to be done. And yeah. she really marshaled the forces on that one. You know, I think she behaved admirably. Um, so before we go, just it, it, talking a little bit about the book, um, well, two things. Who were some of the most fun people you got to talk to for the book? Well, our dear friend Piper Laurie was angelic, as you yes. can imagine, and she's just a lovely person. Carol Burnett was a thorough delight. Oh, Very warm and great. down to earth. Yeah. yeah. And they were great friends. Yeah. And they were in a stage production of I Do, I Do in the mm-hmm. 70s, which was very successful. And, you know, William Reynolds, who not a lot of people know, movie buffs will know him mm-hmm. as Jane Wyman's son and All That Heaven Allows. But oh, yeah. He was terrific. And I asked him about, you know, what's interesting about projects like this is sometimes the satellite people who, that you get to interview yeah. are often as fascinating as your subject. Yes. Or they're just, they have wonderful anecdotes and nobody takes the time yes. to interview them. I right? Except Com- Ileana Douglas. Uh, no, yeah. I completely, I want every story that was ever told. And uh, and I mentioned before that it's it's an option for a movie. Mm-hmm. Congrats. I'm so excited. Do you have Thank any, you. do you have any input as to who's going to be rock? Any, this any is wish the, list? See, my theory is, Ileana, that they should do the, the Scarlett O'Hara thing and cast someone that is sort of established but not very well known. It would just be right. interesting. Well, like Rami Malek. There you go. Look at how well that worked out. Perfect example. Mm. I, I like. And we have a great director, Greg Berlanti, mm. and it's so interesting that all the auteurs are of Italian ancestry. Uh huh. Fellini, Visconti, Scorsese, Minnelli, Berlanti. That's you know. interesting. Mm. Well, you know, Marty was such a huge Minnelli fan. Mm-hmm. Was obsessed with him and read and. Everyone should be obsessed with Vincent Minnelli. I know he was yeah. really he was just a great tastemaker. And uh, what are are you working on any new books or? I have a, a, what's your new or if you can say I have an intriguing idea. I've never done a novel, mm-hmm. and I came across this fascinating story. It's you know an unsolved murder case here in Hollywood from the forties, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. does have a celebrity connection, and it just I found it astonishing that no one had zeroed in on it. So. I think I would like to attempt. It would be very much in the Raymond Chandler mode. Yeah. There's quite a few mysterious (laughs) murders. To say the least, yeah. (laughs) Some of them involving Wallace Beery uh, (laughs) and things like that. People, you know. I I can't believe they never, and they never did like the Eddie Manick story or anything like that. Yeah, probably too dangerous. I know, all sorts of surly things. (laughs) Well, anyway, Mark, thank you so much for being here. I I want everybody to get this book. It's, uh, It's terrific, All That Heaven Allows, spring reading here on National Book Day. And thanks exactly. so much for being here. Thank you, Ileana. You can look for Mark on Twitter at Movies with Mark That's and right. on Instagram at mgriffin71368. And his website is markgriffinauthor.com. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. And you can buy Ileana's mm. book, too. That's I've right. read Dennis Hopper. She's working on the After Dark version, so you should probably read <laughs> That's this right. before that one comes out. Um, also, like our page on Facebook and the oh, website for the show is ilianaspodcast.com. That's right. We're here today. We're live. This was so exciting. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for being here. My and pleasure. as we always say, uh, life is like a movie with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And today's the end of our movie. So thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Bye. From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.